so glad you're all here. Um, so today, the kind of overarching topic is intersectionality. And um, our, our, the group of us, you know, we stemmed from um, a kind of a feminist book club idea um, that got more, far, farther reach than just the circle of people that I knew. Um, because of the Women's March and the Women Sister March Network had like posted a um, a forum for like connecting with people in your community to have smaller smaller groups to gather together to learn and support each other in activism and so um, that's where this group was born from um, and I'm sorry I, I, maybe most of you know be know me but I'm Emma Jenkins <laughs> hi um, and. So, so yeah, so the goals of our group are to grow our understanding of um, intersectionality and intersectional feminism through readings and podcasts and documentaries and um, community groups coming in to educate us. And um, also a point of this group is to support each other and share with each other around um, any actions that, that we um, feel are important and to build capacity on, whether those are grassroots actions locally or ways we can influence decisions being made nationally. Um, so that's why we're here. Um, and so, so I'm Emma, and um, maybe we should just introduce oh, ourselves. Okay. I'm Joe Murray. Um, I'm a high school special educator, and I happen to know Emma through our master's program, and just wanted to be more involved and I was really excited about the notion of trying to reach out and help inform others and also myself and build my own understanding. So, also one of the organizers is Mackenzie. Hi. Thank you. Oh man, haven't held a mic in a long time. Um, hi everyone, I'm Mackenzie. Um, I just recently joined leadership to help with branding and work on the library and the website. Um, as a day job, I work right back there at AO Glass, um, and I also am doing herbalism and trying to be more active, so doing a lot of things. Do we want to do a whole oh, intro? Sure. Yeah. Um, my name's Alana. I'm from the Pride Center of Vermont. Um, I'm graduating from St. Michael's College this year, and I'm looking to go into nonprofit work and kind of give back to the communities in other ways. Great. You guys are amazing. Thanks for being here. Um, okay, what do I want to say? Oh, go over the agenda. So yeah, so we're kind of uh, rethinking the agenda to be a little more free-flowing since there's a smaller group. But essentially, we want to have um, some group discussion about what um, what's going on out there, what um, current events maybe we need to better understand, um, share about what we're all working on, what um, actions we're doing on our own time or other readings that we're doing, what, what else are we learning and, and doing to help resist, um, and discuss the readings that we sent out if you had an opportunity to read, watch, or listen to anything. Um, and then come up with some questions um, for our panelists. Hi, Alana. Sorry, I didn't. <laughs> Welcome. Um, um, but maybe since it's a smaller group, it can be a little less of a QA and a and more of a formal um, discussion. I know Elise from RAD, who just stepped out, she loves small group conversations, so. Um, and then we're gonna discuss our identity. Um, you probably noticed the theme of the reading was cultural appropriation, and we're not too happy about our name, and so we want to change a name and go through a more collaborative process of a more inclusive and um, name that identifies with everyone in this group. Um, and then we wanna end with um, some actions, making some commitments to each other, and. Um, promising what we're going to do going forward after this meeting, because the action doesn't end by attending here. All right. Um, so some agreements. Um, my number one rule is that you take care of yourself, and um, if you need to step out, if you need to answer your phone, if you need to get food or drink or use the bathroom, please do that. Um, whatever will help you to be present here. Um, take care of your needs. Um, also, sharing airtime when we do get us in a discussion. Um, Please speak when you feel you need to, but, and speak with equity to make space for others to chime in. Um, one tool that we could use uh, that I'll just recommend is the ouch and oops tool, which I actually use with my students. I'm an elementary school teacher. And um, ouch is what you say if somebody offends you or you know hurts feelings, or um, 
something that, that, that um, harms you in some way. And then oops would be the response to someone saying ouch to you, um, just recognizing that you made a mistake or maybe um, you know, admitting some fault. Um, challenge your privilege, right? Lean into that aspect of your identity. Um, be ready for some discomfort there. Um, small groups. Is there any other norm or agreement that you guys think we need to have a productive conversation tonight? Good. All right. If you think of anything, you can always add it. All right. All right. I guess it's me. Um, so I think we wanted to start with small group discussions, and since this was kind of when we were thinking about this and looking at the framework of this meeting, um, we were thinking like five to eight people, but since this is a nice size, I think, um, to get us started. And again, we really wanted to go over just kind of updates. How are you doing? What are you doing? Um, what's happening in our world? Um, particularly recently with James Comey, there's just a lot um, to talk about. So we wanted to give you some space to wrestle with that and understand what's going on and kind of ask questions if you have questions, because it's hard to know everything right now. Um, and then brainstorm some actions, what's next? Um, and then really dive into our watch, read, listen. Um, and I know maybe not everyone uh, was able to dive into those, which is perfectly fine and, in fact, acceptable and expected um, because we all lead very busy lifestyles. But again, since we are kind of wrestling with the woke club name um, and how we really feel like that is cultural appropriation, we want to have some conversations before launching into potentially renaming ourselves, because we wanted to make sure that was a really like meaningful collaborative process as much as it could be for our group. Um, so, and then ma potentially making a panel question or kind of like percolating some stuff in your mind. Um, so did anybody kind of want to start around either an update of what you've been involved in or any questions or kind of like things that you've really been focused on currently? For one thing, I. I, I missed out on what the uh, the name issue is. I didn't know that Woke Club name was appro appropriated by somebody else, and I don't know if everybody else knows about that. And I, I want to know how you feel about it, and do you feel victimized by it? Yeah, I can speak. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I have this whole speech. I might reference it, but I guess I don't need it. <laughs> um, but basically, so I can just tell my sort of story is I started coming, I came to the first and second huddle, um, and I knew I wanted to get involved with branding um, because of my visual nature and wanting to give this club um, sort of just like an extra punch and like how do we get ourselves out there and make ourselves available to many, many people. Um, and so I sort of was like, okay, but before I put my name on this, like, I, I need to address the fact that I feel that woke is appropriative. And the team completely agreed with me, and we kind of were like, why didn't, you know, why didn't we do this sooner? But that's not the point. <laughs> the point is that we're doing it now. Um, and to explain some background is the term woke or stay woke um, is a term that was made within the black community for the black community. So as um, a leadership and um, you know, mostly the people who come here are white presenting, um, not everyone, but most, most everyone, um, we feel that that word is not ours to use and that there are so many words that we could use, we don't need to use that one. And we can leave that um, for the community to whom it was intended. Um, and choose a new name, um, something that maybe reflects our interests or you know mission greater than that word does. Does that um, help you yes. to understand? Perfect. Um, and so we have little ballot boxes over there, um, and we have three new names. Although we're in the small group, so if you have a burning name yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you feel would be so good, please tell us. Um, but the three names that we kind of narrowed down are Wild Rose League, Femme Club, and Rise and Resist. And I can explain some conceptual background of them. Um, <laughs> Wild Rose League, the acronym WRL is Watch, Read, Listen, which is often how we formulate our meetings, um, as well as the fact that 
you know, everyone needs some rose medicine nowadays um, for our hearts. And Fem Club obviously is just a spin on the name we already have, um, but being more um, inclusive to our audience and leadership. And then Rise and Resist is kind of a spin on like R&R, &R, but rather than resting and relaxing, <laughs> we're rising and we're resisting. Um, so those are kind of our, our three names that we've narrowed it down. Um, and again, if you have a burning name, please, please bring it up. But, you know, you'll be making our choice for us because we want to collaborate on this, um, make sure everyone feels heard about the name. So, yeah, of course. Um, I'm, I'm Kim, since no one's going to remember that. Um, yeah, I really liked, thank you, I really enjoy the whoever put together the the reading and the, yeah, really well done. I had no clue about woke or stay woke. And I have to say how sad I was because as a recently awokened person, I guess, I don't know. I don't know how to say that appropriately. Um, I've been napping a long time, <laughs> like really napping, really complacent. And, you know, things have been pretty good for me. Um, and. This recent election just hit me. I don't know why all the other signals I got to wake up just didn't, you know, they didn't really smack me hard enough, I guess. Um, but this definitely shocked me. And um, I'm really enjoying the, the learning part as much as the struggle with the learning part. You know, when I read the, the article that illuminated the, the meaning of woke, I was like, my initial response was like, well, I really like that word, you know, like woke really, you know, can't we make that white? Because like, really, like, I mean, I'm going to be real. Like, I, I definitely had, the, and all I could think of was the South Burlington rebels. And I'm like, oh God, like, all right, I'm an idiot. Again, I'm a knucklehead and that's been coming home a lot and I'm okay with it because I got to be where I am. But, um, you know, I really enjoyed, I really love the readings that challenge me, and, I, and I'm and i not in college, I'm well, well beyond that. Um, but you know, like I, I don't always find the readings that challenge me as much. I mean, I definitely, I have joined a uh, activist book club, so I'm, I'm reading some stuff. But you know, it's almost like I stumble across stuff sometimes it feels, and then I really like that element in this club. And, and I really, I can't say I liked my reaction, but it, it definitely was very, for lack of a better word, interesting to watch my own progression as I read that from sort of like, because you said, did it, does anyone, would anyone's feelings hurt? It wasn't hurt, but I was like, I was like, I'm, I'm kind of attached to this name. Like, can't, can we like just all agree to be white? You know, like just some really lame bullshit. And I just, I, I mean, I'm owning it. It's just, it's lame bullshit. And it's like, okay. And this is like for a more potentially possibly heading towards waking up white woman. So it's, that's definitely a, a, you know, so I'm like listening to these names and going, God, they just don't have that kick, you know, like rise and resist, bless everybody for whoever came up with those names. I haven't really thought of anything other than like showing up kind of stuff because it's got the upward. But, um, you know, like rise and resist, it's kind of like the resistance. It's, it's all of that stuff is so like why I'm here, true. Um, but like, I don't know, we need a kick, you know? And I obviously need a kick because I'm half napping and kind of like every so often, like, oh, oh, okay. You know, so we have to be where we are. Um, so I just wanted to own that because um, cause, cause I'm such a knucklehead. It's just who I am, so thank you. And, and thanks for the article too, it was really helpful. I mean, I think the, and I don't want to speak for Emma or Mackenzie here, but I know my personal reaction, you talked about maybe, like, how did we react to figuring this out and realizing this is cultural appropriation? And I think humble comes to mind immediately. Um, you know, I think particularly with what we originally envisioned for this process and kind of like trying to educate ourselves and be more transparent and be more informed and be able to stand up for um, both our own identities and be really strong allies for others. Um, 
I think humbled, really. Like, throws yeah. it in there um, as far as how we reacted to it as a group. Um, and there were definitely conversations. We talked a couple of times and emails back and forth around it and really wanted to make a meaningful decision. Um, I don't know if you want to share your own. Yeah. Yourself. Yeah, I just, um, it was a major oops moment, right? Like, back to our agreements. And I think that um, as a white person, committed to and trying to do my best towards anti-racist work um, that I was especially like, oh my God, wait, I can make a mistake? Like, I can choose the wrong thing? Like, I, and so I think, and that's what um, being a white person in anti-racist work is, is a lot about a lot of the time. It's, it's that, like, white fragility reaction and having to just admit you made a mistake and actions are better than words. So do the right thing, admit fault, and you know, try to be better in the future. I don't know. Elisa and Jeff want to introduce yourselves. We, we did a quick round robin <laughs> hello. Yeah, while sorry, you and we, we came in late. Um, yeah, my name is Elise Greaves. Um, was there any like introductory? Oh, great, Elise. <laughs> oh. How's it going, guys? Pleasure to see you today. My name is Jeff for Caesar, and uh, yeah, I'm with Black Lives Matter and Rights and Democracy as well. Nice. Oh, so we. <laughs> um, maybe we can do any actions or things we've been doing. Right? Is that next on the? Yeah. Or any any current events in the social media process? Oh. <laughs> All of it. Sure. Everyone. <laughs> so. As a resident black man in this group, I will share an experience that happened actually a couple weeks ago. And it happened in you know, South Burlington where we thought nothing you know, bad would happen. I was, we're, part of my job, we go door knocking and we talk to people in the neighborhoods. We say, hey, how are you doing? You know, I'm with Rights of Democracy. You want to help build a revolution? You know, people really get into it. And so um, for me, that's one of my favorite parts of the job is because you know, some days, I'm going down the state house, some days I'm working with the lease, some days I'm going door knocking in, and really able to engage with the community, see what the needs are, see what, you know, those who agree with us and those who don't agree with us, see how they feel about the policy, and take it back and, you know, do more substantive work with it uh, later down the road. And so, I was, you know, in South Burlington, I knocked on a door. I met a lady, hi, how's it going? My name is Jeff Caesar, I'm with Rights and Democracy get a few more sentences in, and she says, oh my God, I love it, I love it. I'm a progressive, I'm on the progressive committee, I'm on the progressive council, and we do this, that, and the other. We start talking, we get this long, awesome conversation about you know, the different stuff, uh, the, the women's march, and how much she loved you know, women's reproductive rights. Um, you know, we, she gave a donation without even thinking about it. As I'm leaving, she's saying, hey, all right, go to that neighbor, go to that neighbor, they're progressive, they're liberal, they're Democrat, don't go to that next house. They're conservative, they're too Republican, they're not gonna listen to you. All right, great, thank you so much. So I'm going down the street and I go to the next house and she's like, no, 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 don't go to that house, go to the next one. They're the ones that are gonna be nice. I went to that same house anyways and they were actually very nice, so she was wrong. They were, you know, they were liberal. But anyways, um, yeah, so a couple nights later, I get a phone call and it turns out that this lady who I was speaking with had lost her phone within the proximity of me showing up at her house. So although she was such a wonderful progressive and who was very aware and awake about, you know, the social injustice of what's going on in our communities and around the world, her first gut reaction was that this young black guy that came in to my foyer stole my phone. Not only did I steal her phone, apparently. I was from a fake organization. My organization doesn't exist. Uh, the donation that she gave me was another stolen donation. So she filed a police report against me. And uh, that was a thing. And so in order to get more information, she goes on front porch forum and posts about it. She so succinctly, you know, uh, um, recalled our entire policy platform that the post was immediately forwarded to our executive director and he got in contact with me to let me know what happened. 
this is after I would come from an organization that's fake and not real, right? And so um, I email her, I contact her, she apologizes immediately. Tears, oh my God, please, I, you know, I forgive me, I didn't mean to do that, I found the paperwork afterwards, I found this and that, and um, you know, that, that's great and well. She went and she said, I'll update the post. She updates the post, and her words exactly. I really apologize to you know, Jeffrey Caesar and Rights and Democracy, I really stand behind their work. Um, he's a great guy, definitely didn't steal my phone. My racial bias got the best of me, and you know, I, I, that's something I need to own and hold on to and, and work for and make better. This really excited me seeing such young kids going around and you know, getting really active in their community because I teach social activism at X Vermont company. And so this woman not only teaches, you know, this, that it like, like this, she's spreading that message out to other people under the guise of being woke, being progressive, being forward thinking. And what she did was extremely harmful because now we look, I can't, I don't even go door to door anymore. It's a vulnerable place. For weeks afterwards, she didn't call and update the police department that you know, um, that this actually wasn't an issue. So any time I was walking down the street and, you know, canvassing doing my job, I could have easily been picked up, had a bullet put in the back of my head, or been subject to, you know, street harassment like that. And so it's, it's, it's a very, you know, it's a tacit, um, it's, a, it's a delicate walk of, you know, being aware and making sure that, you know, uh, within the struggle, whatever the struggle is, that we're being inclusive of all the perspectives because uh, of, of, of what, what, what's going on, you know. Um, and, you know, making sure that we're, you know, definitely in like the, those instances where, you know, you're saying, yeah, I had this thought and that was kind of silly of me. That's awesome because it's like the first step is owning it and understanding it and realizing it. And it's, there's a space of, you know, becoming comfortable, being uncomfortable. And getting down to the root of it, of what's going on. So, that's it. That's all right. Yeah, but it's uh, it's okay. It's not all right. Yeah. It's all right, but it's not all right. It's not all right. It's more than, than just your story. It's indicative of, of, a, of our society. And it's, it's easy to say, oh, she was crazy. And it was a crazy incident. You know, how old was she? Was she really, you know, on the edge of uh, dementia or something? Is possible? You know, it sounds like it. It could be. But this is, this is, it hits me right in the gut here listening to you. And I'm sorry that you have that experience. And that it's happening all the time. I think one of the reasons why we wanted to not only have kind of like what we envisioned as larger group discussions, but also started a kind of smaller group discussions um, every now and then. The next one is May 24th, just to throw that out there, um, is also because I think within each of us are kind of like really ugly perspectives and blind spots and kind of things that we don't want to admit exist and are there, but we really need to obviously kind of first be able to recognize that they exist and then take steps to remedy that in some shape or form. And that requires us to be incredibly uncomfortable um, in ways that I don't know if we've ever really felt possible, particularly when we live in this part of the country. Um, and particularly a state where I think a lot of us get kind of complacent around, oh, we're Vermont, we're liberal, we're safe space, et cetera, et cetera. But that just recognizing that's not the case for a, a, people within our community um, is really uncomfortable for those who haven't directly experienced it. And I certainly don't want to speak for people, but I think that can 
be something that I'm personally humbled by regularly and trying to just recognize that that's true for people um, and that what sort of like biases lie within my own self and somebody who identifies as like progressive and like, oh, I'm really, you know, trying my hardest and I do a bunch of these readings and I'm trying all the time and every day and I'm like angry a lot of the time too. Um, and, or saddened too. Emma and I were just talking about this too. Like when I don't have enough energy, I'm sad. When I do have a lot of energy, I'm angry a lot of the time. Um, and you know, that's a huge identity shift for a lot of people when we think that like we already have and value all of these things. And then we realize within ourselves are kind of like really horrendous truths that we need to recognize and overcome and own when it's really not okay to own those things in a lot of spaces. I don't know. You know, people had reactions. <laughs> know who to um, that yeah. So, again, thank you for sharing. And um, I think that there's a, a balance between informing ourselves and acting because, you know, it, it's not the responsibility of other people to, you know, tell us these things. Like, that's why we get informed and we read and we watch and we listen. And the video um, about white fragility and veganism, um, I actually found after a Black Lives Matter meeting, I had a white fragility moment and I went home and I started crying and I was like, I need to figure this out and I need to like, I need to dig into this. Um, not to say I've solved it at all, but this video like, you know, it's an hour and a half long, and this woman just speaks so powerfully about it and really, like, spoke to me um, and helped me process what I was feeling and confront it and start to talk with myself about it, um, kind of like you are mentioning with the article. Um, so that's one part of it for me. And then the other part of it is getting back out there and going back to the Black Lives Matter meeting and going back to the store and noticing myself in the moment have like a thing in my head that's definitely racial bias and being like, no, like don't do that. You know, like sometimes like, you know, I'll just sit and look at myself and just be like, you're racist, like, and you need to like deal with that. Like, you know, not because I am wanting to be emotionally, but because the system grew me that way. And that's just what I need to do personally to get, you know, get this like out of, out of me. And it takes practice and it takes um, a long time of working toward it. So why I'm really passionate about this club is because I feel like we can support each other in that um, expand our minds by expanding and sharing our resources and then I mean I love small circle discussions I think they're very healing and um, helpful so I'm happy that we're all here talking together Do you want to speak oh, yeah. oh, they, they, seriously thank you for sharing that um, So uh, that was really moving, and a part of me was thinking, like, you know, that could be me. Not really, but, it, like, it really couldn't. But, like, there's that part of me that, I mean, truthfully, I really can't see that, but it's just, like, maybe in a, that would be my profile. So, you know, when I, one of the things I've really noticed about living in Vermont is, is obviously conspicuously white. I'm, I'm originally from Brooklyn and I'm used to more color just walking around, not even like I know anyone, but just like, just visually it's so appealing. I mean, it's just, I like that. And, you know, as I'm listening to your story, I, I just, it was so heartbreaking. It was just so, hard. I just, my heart just broke just hearing that and knowing that that's, that, that, that's true. I'm a therapist, and I and I and it's not the first time I've heard a variation of that story. And I, what, leading into sort of like actions that we're taking and and how we're thinking, and 
intersectional feminism and all of these things. Like the Woke Club, reading that article, I had no fucking clue. I'm like, really? Like, I never even heard the Woke name before. I saw Woke Club wherever I first saw it and showed up. I had zero. So it's like, you know, it does give you pause to think, like, how many other words are there that I'm probably just blah, 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 which is what I meant when I said that could have been me. It was not so much that I would think someone stole my phone, which I know I always lose. Um, <laughs> don't I get the easy off there? But, like, just in my language, like, you know, look, look at the South, like I mentioned before, the South belongs to rebels, and it's like, there's no way they can't know that. You know, that's what I'm thinking. There's no way they can't know that. But it's like, and then I'm here in the Woke Club, and I'm like, how many people would say there's no way she wouldn't know that when, like, I read that, and I was like, wow. How do, how do you know that? Who knew that for, like, how weird that, like, I don't even know the history, to be honest. So one of the things that I do is I write a lot of postcards on everything. Um, because, I, first of all, I like, I'm very tactile, and I like the whole, like, you know, concept of, like, all these postcards show up, like you are here. And that's very appealing. Um, so one of the things that I and a couple of my middle-aged white friends, women friends do is we go to Black Lives Matter to write postcards because it's kind of like, okay, I'm not the shop for change. I wasn't really sure. Like, so we went over and, um, and it was just, it's just been really interesting. Um, the last time, then I, my computer died. And anyway, long story. I haven't been there in two weeks. But at any rate, the last time that we were there, we started this. We started having a really interesting conversation, and um, with Ebony. And and one of the things she asked was something about, you know. She was talking about like, well, the white woman identity. We were kind of going back and forth, and pretty, pretty, pretty open. And and I went home. And I'm like, holy. Shit. I don't have a white woman identity. I'm like, what? I'm like 58 years old. I don't have a white woman identity. What's wrong with me? And I, re I remember reading something in one of the bajillion things I read about, I think it was a black woman's article. Anyway, it was talking about look in the mirror and a white woman sees a woman and a black woman sees a black woman. And I was like, well, there you go. Like, I don't even know I'm white because I don't have to. I don't need to. Because I just go through and I... I do my thing and no one suspects I stole their phone or whatever. But just that question, like, she, I can't remember the exact question, to be honest. It was sort of like about, you know, we were talking about, like, um, I think I had said something about, like, my recent aw waking up, you know, and realizing through, quite frankly, some articles, like, oh, I haven't exactly been there for my white sister, my black sisters. I haven't been there for my white sisters either, to be honest. Sorry, guys. Uh, women. Uh, guys, too. But it was just like, wow, like, it really does it take Donald Trump to wake me the f up? I mean, like, seriously? Like, really? So, like, I, I suppose I should be, God forbid you ever thank Donald Trump for anything, but I am willing to give him that one, that it's, it's certainly made a lot of people in the country at least start considering things that they haven't been. And it's not that I haven't been considering this, because, you know, it's like the woman who answered the door. Hi, I'm a progressive. I'm a therapist. I did my multicultural class, and, you know, I had all sorts of revelations, and they were marvelous. You know, I'm a racist. I can admit that. But then we get to the action part, and what do you do with that? It's one thing owning it, but what do you do with that? You know, the world is going in a way I don't want it going. I'm seeing all this stuff, and it's freaking me out, and I'm reading all this. It's like, what does the doing part mean? What's the interpersonal part mean? How do we persuade people? How do we enroll people into a way of thinking that engenders an openness and a commitment to move forward together? And I think that's... I mean, that's why I'm here. So, anyway. Um, I'm going to really artificially switch gears here. <laughs> um, just to be transparent, I did invite Alana here, and I know she has to leave early. Sorry. So, <laughs> I, I just want to give her a chance to um, talk a little bit about her work. Um, and if you, and if you are just enjoying that, like feel no, feel really free, um, <laughs> and um, just to have her talk a little bit about maybe what intersectionality means for your work. Are, are you cool with that? Yeah. So that you get a chance before you go. Yeah. 
sorry. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't mean to cut anybody off. Um, and yeah, I just happened to see the clock, and I was like, oh. Um, but yeah, so intersectionality is um, something that I've been working with a lot this year um, in terms of the Pride Center and also like externally. So this is a really great meeting to have been invited to. Um, so for those of you who might not know, uh, the Pride Center of Vermont is like a Burlington-based LGBT community center, um, but they sections of their work also uh, serve people throughout Vermont. So it's really great. And even in Plattsburgh, we've served clients in Plattsburgh as well. Um, and so it, the goal of the Pride Center is to celebrate, educate, and advocate with and for LGBT Vermonters um, and to really make sure that they have the resources and the support that they need. And so we, we welcome people into the Pride Center itself, like the physical space, and we also uh, send people to do trainings and education work um, in, in outside communities and in, in workplaces and things like that. Um, they're really fantastic, and they also do a lot of um, state advocacy and for policy change, as well as individual advocacy on the behalf of clients with employers and housing authorities and um, other things of that nature. And so some of the programming that the Pride Center offers um, is that we have, we have three individual offices, although we all collaborate constantly. So we have like the health and wellness the center, we have uh, the programming department, and then we have the safe space anti-violence program. And I've primarily been working with the safe space program and they're really phenomenal. Um, but as, as a whole group, we offer um, support groups for LGBT people with disabilities, for older adults, uh, for gay, bi, and trans men, or anyone like on the masculine spectrum. Um, we also offer free and anonymous HIV testing, um, which not a lot of people know. And you can, there are walk-in hours uh, twice a week, and you can just come in, and it's really fast. Um, and then you know your HIV status, which is great. And then we also have a community space that's relatively new. And so we have the library, and we have computers, and free Wi-Fi that people can access, um, which is really great because a lot of our clients and a lot of the people we serve um, don't have consistent housing, and they are at risk for homelessness, or they are homeless, and so it's a great place for people to come and just like look for jobs, or like look for housing, or just like access basic media, and just be regular people and participate in society um, without feeling like they are missing out on something or feel like they can't access services. So that's really great. Um, and then the safe space program is primarily direct service work. And so there's a hotline that people can call, they can email us, and we help them with just general support. Um, so we are there if people just need emotional support. Um, we collect and give back resources if there's questions about insurance or about like LGBT friendly places to shop or things of that nature. And so part of my job um, was actually a lot of uh, correspondence with um, inmates and with people who couldn't necessarily like make it to the Pride Center or didn't have email or anything like that. And so they could send us letters and they could call us and I would gather information and send it right back. Um, and that's also uh, the, the department through which we go through for trainings. Um, and so one of my coworkers right now is putting together like an employee sensitivity training for Planned Parenthood of Northern New England. So that's really exciting. Um, and so that's the work that we do. Um, in terms of intersectionality, um, this was a really big shock for me when I first started working there, which was back in February. So, I mean, in order to educate myself, like I'm constantly educating myself and just trying to read absolutely everything that I can read um, and making sure that the authors of articles and books and other things that I, and other media that I consume are not just cis white people or cis white queer people, it's, it's people of all different races and genders and ethnicities and just making sure that what I'm consuming is diverse in its content as well as in its creators. So that's really important for me. And then so I kind of knew about all these issues surrounding LGBT people. Like I knew that there were intersections of mental illness and that um, queer people have higher rates of like suicide and mental health problems. And I knew that uh, we were at a higher risk for homelessness and joblessness and all of these things, but it wasn't until that I actually got to the Pride Center and were interacting with these people every single day and hearing their stories and doing this work for them that I really understood it and it actually really hit me. And it hit me really hard and for the first couple weeks, like I was always excited to go into work because I love the people that I work with and I love the work that I do, but it was really hard to go in knowing that I was going to have to face someone day after day, knowing things that they'd gone through and knowing what they were struggling with and like still be like, hi, how you doing? Like, how are you? And not be like, oh my God, like, are you okay? And so that was really difficult because nobody, 
nobody lives like single issue lives. Like everyone that I work with ha is facing like some kind of intersection, whether it's gender or ethnicity or mental health or physical ability is also really, really important um, in the line of work that I've been doing. And so it was just really, really eye-opening. And it really made me assess kind of like how all of our identities intertwine. And so that was super important. Um, and so when you're helping someone, it's not only like, hey, like this, this trans person is having trouble finding a job. It's like, no, like this, this person um, is trying to find a job and also stable housing and they can't access certain places because they have like a physical disability and they also um, are seeking mental health services, but they need a therapist who is um, accessible in these certain ways. And so it's, it can be very difficult to get people the support and the resources that they need, but it's, it's really important that we do it and that we take into consideration where they're coming from and what exactly they need. So we can't just give them a therapist's name and be like, try this one. We really have to screen them and be like, well, you live in this area and you can only access public transportation. And so we need to get you somewhere that you can get to via public transportation who accepts LGBT clients who has experience working through certain mental health issues. And so that's, it's, it's really important and it's exhausting, but it's really, really important. And you can tell we have, we have clients that come in um, multiple days a week, every week, every day, or who call really frequently because they need us. And that's, that's what's been so motivating for me. And I know that's what's part of the motivation for a lot of my coworkers is just knowing that like there are people who rely on us and who rely on these services. And it's important that we keep going, even though it's emotionally draining. And even though you take it home with you most nights, because it's really hard to shake that off. So that is, that is something that I've, I've learned really quickly is that there's a big difference between reading about issues on the internet and understanding statistics and like interacting with the people every day who face this. And so it's been like a very much humbling experience for me because I can, like I've gone through a lot of things, like everyone's gone through things, but it's like, I have a place to go at night. Like I have parents who accept me and who didn't kick me out of their house. Like I am white. And so I have all the privileges that come, go, go along with being white and having a very white name. So that's been, it's been, it's been uh, a ride. It's been an experience, but it's been one that I've valued very, very much. And um, I've also, in the work with the Pride Center, we've also started partnering with, not just started, but we've been working with other community organizations. And so we, we've been working with Migrant Justice a lot in the Milk with Dignity campaign. Um, I, one of um, my supervisors, Julia, she's been doing work with Migrant Justice and Black Lives Matter and um, a lot of other, or, and 350 Vermont has been another big one, Green Mountain Self Advocates, which is um, an organization in Montpelier for people with disabilities. Um, and so it's just kind of, making sure that we have allies in other places and knowing that and kind of passing that on to our clients and to the people who access our services to know that you have allies here and you have people that will help you here and we can also connect you with other places. And so that has been something that I've learned a lot about. So I've learned about a lot of great organizations in Burlington that I didn't know about before. So that's been super awesome. And um, yeah, so some of, I have a list of like, places like um, like websites and organizations that have helped me and I've, I've sent you an email about it as well so if you would like to pass that on that's totally that would be awesome and yeah I'm open to any questions you all have or I can forward the messages if I can't exactly g answer your questions so thank you So I started working at the Pride Center because I knew my supervisor, Julia, from her time at St. Mike's, and I, um, I really enjoyed being around her, and I, I knew the work she was doing was important, and I actually bumped into her at Pride uh, last fall, no, this past fall, 2016, and she was like, hey, like, if you want to do more nonprofit work and more outreach work, you should come to the Pride Center, and so I did, and so I, um, I just jumped right in. Um, I've always been really passionate about... Um, community service and any kind of outreach and any kind of um, service work. Um, and the Pride Center for me was the place to do it because like as someone who is queer, it was really important to me that I helped other people who shared identities with myself or who had shared certain experiences or people who had had worse experiences um, and just kind of make sure that they had had, their, they, they got the resources that I was able to get for myself or that were given to me. 
And so that's why I kind of got started with them. Yeah. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, any last questions for Alana? Um, I'll I, um, <laughs> this is something that I've been struggling with. Um, under the Trump administration, I, I don't think, I don't want to say things haven't gotten worse because in some ways they definitely have um, with, the, uh, <laughs> with the ACHA repealing the, uh, replacing the ACA, that's going to take away healthcare for a lot of people, including a lot of LGBT people who are already struggling to find employment, to find healthcare. Um, specifically, um, like trans people and people with LGBT people with mental illnesses. So that has me really concerned on a policy level. And obviously, Mike Pence has a history of being horrific with LGBT people. Um, and I'm, I'm like, I'm really nervous that he's going to have more political sway uh, because he's the one who tried to pass the Religious Freedom Act in Indiana two years ago, and that is technically legal. Um, but it is unconstitutional, so we'll see if he keeps trying to push that through. Um, and also, he very firmly believes in conversion therapy, which is the wor one of the worst possible things that you can do to an LGBT person, is put them into some kind of conversion camp. Um, and so that has me nervous, but um, more than anything, I think that it's brought out prejudice within society. So it's brought out like racism and sexism and so much homophobia, so much transphobia. Um, and it's, it's really scary because, I mean, I've, I've always been cognizant of um, like my identity. And so walking down the street with my girlfriend's always been like, where are we? Like, who's going to say something? And even, it's, even in Burlington and like even in Vermont, um, it happens. And so now I've been even even more nervous. Um, so I mean, I don't. Nothing has been explicitly said against LGBT people yet, but um, with the Gavin Grimm case and the uh, the rereading of Title IX, that has me nervous. Um, and so I'm afraid that there is going to be solid policy in place, and it's not uh, not just um, societal prejudices resurfacing. So we'll see how it goes. Um, but I'm nervous, and a lot of my other queer friends are nervous. Um, are there any specific actions you think that you would want to encourage this group to do regarding? Um, yeah. Um, that's, it's a really difficult question, because there's um, so much of it is like a day-to-day -day basis thing. Um, I would say, um, if you do have LGBT friends, like definitely reach out to them and see how you can be there for them personally, make sure that your friends um, have the emotional support that they need. Because I know like for myself in particular and for a couple of my, my closest friends, um, after the Orlando shooting happened, um, our, like, our straight friends didn't understand. They didn't understand why we were so shaken. Um, and so just making sure that on a very personal level, like knowing, letting your friends and your family members know that like you're there for them and that you'll just listen is super important. Um, and I think that's something that not a lot of queer people get is like that very, um, that very close friendship based level of like, I'm here for you. Um, so that's really important. And also supporting your, your like LGBT community centers is super important. Like not just financially, like if you can volunteer like an hour or two a week, that's phenomenal. And like outright Vermont and the Pride Center, like we always need volunteers for anything, for, for planning events, for just manning the front desk and answering phones. Like, there's always a need for volunteering. And if you can give uh, monetary donations, that's even better, because that helps sponsor programs and help fund people's jobs, because a lot of what Outright and the Pride Center do is based on grants, and grants are few and far between, and it's really difficult to get them. So any kind of volunteer work you can do is always appreciated. Um, and if, if your workplace is one that um, sponsors Pride events, like that's phenomenal. Because I know TD Bank and like a lot of local community organizations sponsor the Pride Parade every year, and that's really great, but it shouldn't stop there. So any kind of outreach you can do with like your place of work or um, other local volunteer options, that's always awesome. And then of course, just like making sure that you're continually like educating yourself and making sure that you are aware of what's going on is always super helpful. Thanks so much, Alana. Really glad you could be here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Come again.
<laughs> um, so I know I interrupted everyone to do that to make sure Alana had the floor. So I just want to say, anyone want to comment on anything or just give a moment to think if there's anything you guys need to share. Okay, um, so maybe Elise? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I think the conversation that we were just having and Alana's presentation um, wraps really well into um, the work that I do as well um, and that Jeff does. Um, but I'm the lead organizer at Rights and Democracy Vermont um, and essentially we're a fairly new organization, just a couple years old. Um, and we are fighting and building in communities across Vermont to put the power back into the hands of the people and make sure that people are part of the decision making process because we are, as Vermonters, um, the people who you know have to deal with the consequences of those decisions um, for better or worse. Um, so we are engaging folks in communities, like I said, around specific legislation um, and also around candidates who share our values um, and who, you know, are part of this strategy of passing legislation and, and having allies in the state house as well. Um, and so one thing that um, I think is really missing in Burma, and we've talked about this a lot, is that it's an incredibly homogenous white state, right? I mean, like, that's just a fact. Um, but when, even in Vermont, when we're talking about, like, dismantling structural oppression, I know that that is a term that gets thrown around a lot in progressive circles and in social justice kind of oriented groups like this one. Um, you know, what we're talking about is ending oppression of the most marginalized. And so intersectionality to me means like centering the experiences of people in our communities who are the most marginalized, um, you know, people of color, um, people of low socioeconomic status, um, the LGBTQAI community is that. <laughs> Okay, I was gonna say, I've seen a lot of variations of the, of the acronym. Um, and so I think, too, recognizing that, you know, as a white woman, like, yes, I, there is like a level of oppression that is working on me, but there are also levels of oppression that I am above and, and adding to and kind of like compliant in if we're not actively fighting back. And so, um, I think that that's just something that I think about a lot uh, in terms of building a movement and who is the movement for and who needs to be part of that. Um, because otherwise, you know, we, we kind of just continue with this like white, hetero, patriarchal society that we live in and that's obviously not working for us, right? Or we wouldn't be here right now. So, um, yeah. I'm probably missing something, and that probably seems a little meta, but that's the gist of it, I think, and how that applies to the work that I do, um, and you know how we can move forward to create a more intersectional movement in Vermont and across the country. So, does anyone have any questions or thoughts or like clarifications about that? Yeah, totally. Um, so as an organizer, so essentially my job is to um, bring people together to take collective action um, around legislation or candidates. Um, and also, you know, a big part of what I do is leadership development and because um, ideally we're a membership kind of grassroots organization. So ideally everyone who is a member of our organization is also um, building their own power. Like we like to think of our members as their organizers as well, right? So they're going out into communities, talking to people about these issues, signing them up for rights and democracy so that we have a bigger base and um, can be more of a force in the state. Yeah, so <laughs> lots, lots of hats on a daily basis, but that's the gist of it. <laughs> can I add on this, Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. And also, uh, when it comes into intersectionality, one of the big things that we're working on this summer is our Democracy Summer, and it's, we're focusing on you know, protest to power, 
how to come together, take action, and really build power in our communities. And so a major role of that is really with all of you guys sitting in this room and our friends that are, are out in our communities that you know are leaders and can be leaders and have different and varying perspectives that we can all bring to the table. And so Isaac is a, our a political director and he's really spearheading the movement politics uh, part of what we'll be doing this summer. And it's really moved to get all of you guys into, you know, into office if that's something you'd like to do or get you into a position where you can really support those around you in your communities that, that, that are you know, really uh, able and capable of driving that change that we'd like to see. So yeah, come on out and stay tuned when you check in. Do you guys do any interstate stuff? I mean, yes. We, I'm, like, I'm really curious about the interstate stuff because it's like I'm writing all these letters. I'm like, sure. Oh, Can I speak to that, actually? Yeah, yeah so. Agree with me. What about mm -hmm. them? That's a question that we get a lot, um, and so we're so we're a bi-state. I know this is like different than what you asked, but we are a bi-state organization. So we're in Vermont and New Hampshire, um, and so you know, in the in the elections um, last year in New Hampshire, you know, we were able to like beat Kelly Ayotte, um, which is really awesome with our team over there. Um, so we get this question a lot because I think. A lot of the folks who are um, kind of coming to activism in this, in the wake of Trump, um, are really focused on what's happening federally, and um, that's I understand that that's scary. And what's happening nationally, we do need to have a resistance. But um, our kind of take on, at Brad is that the best defense is a good offense, and that if we're putting all of our energy into resisting this guy who's like not even going to be in office in like four, eight years, then we're really missing out on, I don't want to say like the point, but I think that th these issues existed before Trump got into office and that there are, is a lot of work to do that's not related to the fact that he's our president. Um, and so our real goal is to, you know, build the power necessary to um, advance our vision for what the what the state could look like, what the country could look like, and really starting on the most local levels because that's where we have the most control and that's where we have the most power to, to make that happen. What? Oh yeah, RAD is the acronym Rights and Democracy. <laughs> Yeah, there, it's like slang. <laughs> um, but, you know, I know that there are a lot of initiatives, especially with like indivisible groups and um, like the sister state project where um, people are making sure that, you know, in 2018, they're communicating with folks who live in like a red state, for example, um, to, you know, make sure that... Structural organizations that are networking across country. When you get to that Midwest, it's kind of like I have no relationship with that. Yeah, totally. And I think even here in Vermont, I mean, we have a great federal delegation, of course, and like. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric, I think, across the country and here, frankly, as residents of like Vermont is a very progressive, like good place to live. And we, you know, we have a lot of problems here in Vermont still, and we still have a lot of priorities that we need to shift here. I mean, for example, you know, we we couldn't pass a $15 an hour wage this year in Vermont. This is like universal health care we don't have yet. You know, we have like the most nonprofit organizations per capita of any state in the country, and we don't even have these kind of like progressive basic principles and policies that, you know, we frankly need and that are talked about a lot. So it's like, why don't we have those? <laughs> um, and I think, you know, it's because the same things that are at play nationally, this kind of like exploitation of our, of our people and planet for profit, I mean, that happens here in Vermont as well. And so we're not as progressive as, as we think we are. Yeah. I know that's not a happy thought, but it's true. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, it's, I had a thought. <laughs> It'll come to you. <laughs> Does anyone?
gather here and there is his body. So for me, I feel like I'm here to listen. And more and more of those were not things that you see. Like, I'm, I've heard of, you know, some of the ballads, all the, that kind of thing, et cetera, et cetera. But the UC on a daily, that's you and your organization are, you see it, your vision. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we're fighting for economic, social, and environmental justice. And essentially, um, you know, when it comes to economic justice and kind of making sure that the policies that are passed like benefit the majority of people, um, you know, what does that look like? It's like providing everyone with the opportunity to care for themselves uh, through universal health care that's affordable and accessible, um, giving people family and medical leave insurance so that they're able to take some paid time off so that like having a kid or a death in the family doesn't like bankrupt you or make you incapable of, you know, living your life um, and having to worry about finances. Um, and then a, a livable wage, I really think. I mean, Vermont, too, is such an expensive place to live. Um, and kind of putting that, like, monetary value on the work that everyone does, I think, can only really serve to benefit the state. And so that's kind of the economic side of things. And I think uh, at the core, too, I think a lot of the issues do come back down to economics and the fact that um, socioeconomic status has a has a much bigger um, role in a lot of this stuff than we than we talk about because it's like so inherently tied to um, issues of like racism and sexism and yeah essentially and then you know with the environment as well. Um, there's a huge kind of like split in the environmental community right now in Vermont around like wind energy and, you know, climate change is obvious. We're a green state, you know, I think we have that kind of rap. Um, but, you know, there are people who in the state like don't agree with renewable energy or the way that that, that system works of like where it gets implemented and who's making those decisions and who's benefiting. And so I think, um, even in the, you know, we're, we just got ranked number two in in like renewable energy in the in the state, um, and so figuring out those problems as well because frankly, like climate change is real and it's happening, and we need to do something about it sooner rather than later. So, the fact that that kind of split exists too over like what we do about that is also very telling. Of like, there's a problem systemically. Um, with what's happening. Do you feel like the action, I'm going to say you, but I don't think it's you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you think are reactionary to something that's like, gets proposed, or is there like a timeline for a specific, take one of the issues, like a specific plan that the organization is on, and like where are you, like, on the timeline? Yeah, yeah, we absolutely have a long term. Bye, Alana, thank you. <laughs> Um, we absolutely have a long-term agenda because, um, you know, the the people who are, I don't want to say like winning and losing, but, you know, frankly, I think sometimes you have to draw that dichotomy. Um, they, you know, have a long-term strategy and they've been plotting this and kind of like making these things happen for a very long time. And so um, to be able to kind of build the world that we want to build. It's it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, and we can't be like constantly putting out fires. So I would say that it's about like moving towards a vision long term rather than, um, you know, kind of making sure that we're protecting the status quo that we live in at every given opportunity when in reality, like the status quo, I would argue, isn't even that great. Even though we have made, we have made advances in, um, obviously, like protections for marginalized communities and um, lost my train of thought. But I, I think, you know, the world is obviously like a more equitable place to live in than it was, say, like 50 years ago because of movements and, and stuff like that. But we're still not where we need to be. And I think a lot of people get bogged down and like, you know, we, we won civil rights. Women won the right to vote. We're, we're done now. We're like a post-racial society, post-patriarchal like sexist society, and that's just not true. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you.
Yeah, and um, uh, in continues to that, looking at you know the economics and how things play out. Measures like increasing the minimum wage or ensuring that you know families are not going broke simply because they can't afford health care, uh, which is one of the number one reasons why people go bankrupt. It's not because people are bad at managing money; they lose their job because of reasons outside of their control. They're you know they get sick and cannot afford medical care. This enables this builds fr systemically uh, from the ground up a better democracy because you know your single mother that's you know, she wants to go vote, but she works across town. She takes public transportation. She has to pick up her kids from daycare. Uh, she is not necessarily going to have the ability to go out and have her voice be put into the ballot. And so when election season rolls around, her perspective and her needs are left out of what any of the politicians that are in her area are saying. This is intersectionality, you know? Um, we, you know, just as Elise was just saying, you know, they, the other side has been really plotting this for a long time. They've been plotting it since the 80s. Most recently, the moment President Obama stepped into office, they were planning on how to get him out of office, if not immediately, but definitely how to get a Republican office in office once he was finally out. And they succeeded. But where we messed up here on the left was that we weren't organizing this whole time like they were. We were sitting back and making fun of them for running around in tea party hats, but they had it down pat. And we cannot forget that Donald Trump did not win the popular vote. He won the electoral vote, which means two years prior, when we didn't go out and vote, they did. And they voted in people who ensured that he now has that seat. And so getting involved in our local democracy and our local politics is of the utmost importance on every single level. And it doesn't matter what issue you care about and what hits home for you the most, go at it with gusto and find an organization or a group that's about it and, 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 and take wind because it's, it's up to us with our feet on the ground. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, if there are no other questions, I think. Yeah, um, and this question is for um, Jeff and Elise, but also for everybody. Um, so, uh, something one of you, something one of you said, made me think about, um, like, as a person with privilege, as a white person who's economically comfortable and um, and safe for a lot of reasons, like how how I I hear the term like using your privilege to be a more active resistor, right? Like, like somehow that a white person is, is like safer to speak out about issues. Um, and so I'm wondering like what that really means and how, how that can be most effective without like perpetuating white supremacy and without like perpetuating a like charity model of social justice work, um, I don't know. Answer, please. <laughs> so um, I guess my immediate thought is like, there are organizations like Black Lives Matter, Migrant Justice, um, who are working on issues of like racial justice and um, you know, supporting like those who are the most marginalized in our communities. And so I think that as, as white people who have that privilege, it's like we, we also need to recognize that there are people like less privileged um, and we need to be showing up and supporting the efforts of those organizations as well. Um, like for example, one of my favorite things that came out of the Women's March um, on, on DC was this sign. It was a woman of color and her sign said like, you nice white ladies are gonna be at the next Black Lives Matter March, right? Um, and you know, I had the honor of hearing, um, her name is uh, Mallory, um, right? I think she, she was like one of the chair 
women of the National March. I think Tamika Mallory. Yes, I got it. So she and she said this thing. She did a talk at UVM a couple uh, months ago, but she said this thing that like really was eye opening for me. Of like, she got sad standing up on stage and seeing like the swarms of people marching uh, to the Capitol because she was like, "Where were you?" you know, a couple years ago when, like, you know, young black kids are getting, like, shot in the street by cops. And it's that, it's that sort of thing of, like, we have so much opportunity to be showing up for things that, like, don't, you know, frankly, like, don't uh, affect us directly, but still, you know, it's, like, an, in, an injury to one is an injury to all of us. And so... Um, but, you know, I think supporting the work that they're doing and showing up for black lives is, is really important, even if we're not leading up that effort. And in, in, in the immediate, one thing that we can all do, um, and it's, no, no, you know, this crosses race, class, gender, sex, um, and, and, you know, all the intersections stand up for each other immediately and in the moment. And when you see something go wrong, someone says something wrong, it, it's so important to advocate. Check in with the person, find out if they're okay immediately. If you see any opportunity for you to mediate or create a different space for that person, you know, whether it's just sitting with them and talking to them while they're being accosted, um, if it's, if it's changing the subject, if it's sticking up for them and turning to whoever or whatever the situation was that was offending and saying, no, this is wrong, and standing by them. And it's, it's putting yourself out there. It's making you vulnerable because you don't know how you're going to be perceived after that. Maybe you don't know if you're being too sensitive. Sometimes it's the case where, you know, there's a little too sensitive, but... More often than not, I can tell you, as someone who's experienced microaggressions out the wazoo, as, as we all have, it's that it's, if I'm left to deal with it alone, it's so much more of a burden. But if at least one person in that room says something with me, then it diffuses so much more of that situation. And it's you know, that much less of, a, of an issue that I personally have to deal with. And so... One, my, my parents always said, um, my mom, she always would say, you must always advocate for yourself because you can never rely on someone else to advocate for you. But most importantly, you must always advocate for the next person because they might not say it, but they might be relying on you. And so with that, I was very fortunate, and now I, you know, I'll stick myself out there and you know, I'll look like a fool. That's fine. But it's, it's one of those things that we, we can all do. And... A little bit more. That's that, that's something immediate. Um, the um, yeah, and I think that's it. Thank you. Um, so I don't. So on my on my Facebook feed, one of the things that I posted, which I thought was hilarious, um, <laughs> it's not that bad. Um, it was this sort of like working class white guy talking about like, you know, being a Trump voter and how he, you know, but then he read, he started hearing about feminism and intersectionality. He starts going into this whole like, you know, intellectual diatribe that's like, there's no fucking way, pardon my French, I curse a lot, that any guy like that would be aware of the kinds of things that those of us who pursue knowledge and are, you know, overly educated like, if you were going to try and demean education. Um, you know, and I thought a lot about, I, I thought it was hilarious because it was a really funny presentation, but it also made me think because it was like, you know, it's a lot of people out there who are, you know, when I read that woke article, the languaging, and I'm like, how do you know that? Like, whip, what? Like, I was, I had no idea. I just, did, shh, no idea. And I believe it's my responsibility to find out. Not that it's, on the pyramid, the rung below me, not that it's below me, but, you know, in that kind of cultural structure, it's not the, per the people below me's job to inform me, it's my job to form myself. But there's a lot of people who, oopsie, clueless. They just, it's just not, 
not happening. So then I think about intersectionality, and I don't know if any of you have looked at the resistance school, watched any of those videos, which I recommend. And the middle, I've, as I mentioned, my computer internet issues, I, I've only watched one so far, and um, it was about persuasion and how to persuade. It was, I, I highly recommend it, and it's about where do you intersect to persuade that person? You know, so you listen to them, because it's all about listening, not about talking, and obviously I'm a talker. So, like listening. So I listen to you, and then I use your language to persuade you that we're actually in agreement and how to come sort of into my camp. And I'm thinking, okay, so the local stuff I'm definitely concerned about because I know that's where I have to act, but I'll be honest, the 2018 election is of great concern to me because I'm also thinking about the next election. Like, I don't want this going, furthering these agendas that I completely and totally 100% disagree with. And then I start thinking about, okay, so I read an article, <laughs> how I live my life, um, about feminists screwed up because they, they don't accept the women who, don't, who believe abortion is a bad thing. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I, like I'm not getting in bed with those animals. And it's just I'm like, OK, so when you look at all of political intersectionality, not necessarily you know, <laughs> watching that guy talk, and I'm like, right, yeah, you're never going to get it. You're just, it was an actor, but like that personality type. And I look at my Facebook page, and there's people who on the far right and on the far left, Hillary Clinton is a great Satan. All of those fake news stories that they posted still are true. And it's remarkable to me, because I'm right and they're wrong. It's very simple. Um, but when I, so when I think about these sort of like, where those concentric rings of different opinions are and where they overlap, so where does my opinion of human rights, women's rights, environmental rights, et cetera, overlap with someone who's like, abortion is murder. Now, I'll be honest, I want to shoot them in the head in a figurative way. But I'm like, you know what? Like, look at my demographic. My this, what you see before you put Donald Trump in office. And I don't know how to talk to those people because I don't know what's going on over there and I don't know where we intersect. And, you know, I, I mean, it's just sort of one of those things where I think we have to build a local movement to build a national movement. And how do we have a conversation to educate ourselves sufficiently that we can then turn to someone who is on a completely different agenda and get enough of them, enough, enough of them to forward something more constructive and positive, given that there's some very f fundamental basic things that we completely disagree on. And Am I such a one-issue voter? I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there's certain things. I'm like, well, I, I think abortion is a horrible thing, but I do believe a woman has a right to choose. So it's kind of like, that's pretty basic. You know, and then I think of, like, you know, we're in a very white state. We, you know, I don't have any black friends here, and I notice it because I got to call out of state to have, you know, get my fix. And, I mean, it sounds so lame, and it is lame, and it's just like, God, I'm like so aware of that, and I don't even know where to begin, you know? And it's sort of like, okay, I, well, you begin where you are. All right, how are you gonna handle that? Like, first of all, you gotta admit a white woman identity. All right, you know, so it's kind of like, how, like to take action in a way, well, first of all, you have to know, okay, ouch. I don't have to admit any kind of identity, because I'm me. And I can, I'm 74 years old, and uh, I don't have to admit anything to you or to anybody else or to anybody in this group. I don't have to say that I have an identity to you. Also, uh, so, ouch. Oops. Okay, I don't need to do it. And Oops. I won't do I, it. Let me, re let me yeah. rephrase that. I, yeah. me, this person sitting in this chair, I, yeah. I'm not at all intending to offend you or hurt you. Well, I, I feel that, uh, that uh, very disconnected from society a lot of the time from because of my age and uh, because it's a whole process, believe it or not, that age is being disconnected and it's going into the next, into death too. And uh, the society is not uh, uh, amenable to people of age. But uh, I think that 
there is a disconnect in the society for a lot of people who had been, say, big Gurney supporters and feeling that we could make a big difference and everything like that. And now in Burlington, only 21% of the people voted in the last election. I mean, there's a great apathy there. And uh, it goes to, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are, Emma? Do you think that you can write a letter to the editor and it would make any difference? Come on. You don't have that power. You, you might have the entitlement that you have a college degree and you're a teacher, but come on, do you, do you really have the power to make a difference? She made and, a difference to me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just uh, saying, you know, do, you, do you really have that power? And, and, and you, you're big, you know, you're big in the rights and democracy. Uh, do you really have the power to change the world? I mean, in the 1960s, we, we believed that the world was going to change, that our children would go to these schools where everybody would love each other and they would learn in a different way. And uh, then the people who were in the movement at that time, the peace movement and all, and great activists and people who had been clubbed on the head and, uh, and imprisoned and uh, everything, and the people who had gone to Canada and, and lost their whole uh, Identity here, identity here in the United States. Uh, they, uh, their lives were demolished, and then the the leaders in the, in the 60s uh, turned into insurance salesmen in the 1980s, and completely turned around and were more interested in the paneling in their rooms than in in a changing society. So I think that to make a movement go, we have to empower each other and and it's not a sense of of uh, a sense of identity which you which i i said ouch on is something that is is written that is set that is uh is a definite a label a label and we have to empower each each person and the marginalized people in, in a way so many people are marginalized in, in this world. And, and in Burlington itself, there's a power structure and the, and the party structure that is, uh, people are so entitled to not get the, not go out and get the vote. They don't care, they, they, they're, going to get the, they're going to get the office. They don't need, even need people going door to door, people who get elected here. Because so, there's a lot of money. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of what? There's a lot of money. I mean, Money. Oh, is, yeah. Can I just respond to what you just said really quickly? Because I have, I like just. I mean, when we're talking about like oppression and levels of oppression and identity, there's actually a critique that is very similar to yours of like, actually, we are all oppressed because we are all, and we're all like powerless right now, frankly, because we are living in a system where people are making money off of us feeling disadvantaged and powerless, and that's where they want us. And they use things like race, and they use things um, like abortion to divide us so that we can't see that the common enemy are, is like the people who are like holding the purse strings at the top of like the societal food chain who are buying our elections and buying the people off who are making decisions about our lives. So in some ways, I agree with you that like we have to come together as a people and not as like people of specific identities but just people who are like we're getting the shit under the stick and we're sick of it and it's not until that happens that we're going to have power to like write a letter to the editor to make the difference that we need to and like that's what the movement is all about and I think that just thinking about like the fact that yeah, I mean, there are levels of privilege, there are levels of oppression, but they don't mean anything when you look at, I mean, they mean something, but if you look at the bigger picture of like who is winning and who's losing, we're all losing. So that's, I mean, that's what I believe too. And it's like, just at what degree are you losing? So that's a scary thought to me. And that's really upsetting. And I think that like until everyone realizes that and people realize that the only way that we're gonna turn this around is if we have a voice and if we keep coming together and fighting back, writing letters to the editor, calling our legislators, that's the only way we're gonna get anything done. 
Yeah, and, and to add on to that, as you, um, a very tangible example of what's happening right now. Um, recently, I don't know if they, what the update is, but the legislature, in pushing forth the budget, they've put clean water and affordable housing against each other for scraps of cash. Both are deeply underfunded. And instead of you know, using the resources that they have uh, outside of those two issues to, to, to generate income, they're taking two issues that deeply affect poor communities, communities of color, elderly communities, uh, 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 disabled communities that are in areas that will be affected by uh, unsanitary water. But what is unsanitary water to communities who are struggling day to day, who cannot afford housing? This is a long-term issue that is so far on the back burner, they're not thinking about it. But 10 years down the road, they'll get, they're the ones getting cancer. They're the ones with, um, with sick children and lead poisoning. But the issue of affordable housing, that's right now. They, they need somewhere to sleep. They need somewhere to get ready and go to work from. This, this is what's happening. And so you've got two issues that are, that, that, that are um, people, of the, the, these communities, these disenfranchised communities are being double hit for the same stuff while everyone else is sitting pretty. And it's completely, completely unfair. And across the globe, you know, it's those who are worst, those who are creating the majority of the pollution and negative environmental and community uh, impacts are the ones not even experiencing it. Because all of those, those, those environmental pollution, uh, all the environmental pollution and external costs of business are going out and affecting the poor communities that have the least ability to mitigate their effects. And so, yeah. Right there with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, I, uh, I just want to take a second to thank everybody for their courage, um, not only just showing up here, but um, sharing stories, asking questions, challenging one another. Um, that's huge. Thank you. It makes, makes me really inspired that everyone is willing to lean into this work. Um, and... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hearing so much um, related to educating ourselves, supporting one another on a micro level in the moment, on a macro level, connecting with grassroots organizations locally and nationally. And so, um, and I want to end on um, a kind of a brainstorming session on, on things that we can do um, in the next week or month. Um, or celebrations of successes that we've had um, in the movement over the last few weeks or months. Um, just to remind each other that we're not alone and we're not going to leave this meeting without ideas of our, of our next steps and um, the next people to connect with. Um, so does anyone have a celebration or to share, share something that we could do coming up? Uh, justice for All, one of the really awesome organizations in Vermont working to um, create an equitable justice in uh, criminal justice system for Vermonters. Uh, they've been working tirelessly. Uh, Mark Hughes is their executive director, and they've been working endlessly to uh, get a bill to establish a police oversight board here in Vermont. And it went through the House, went through the Senate, and now it's sitting on the governor's desk. And so it's um, hopefully it's, it's looking favorable. Uh, they changed a lot in it, but it's still, you know, incredible, historic, historic, historic bill uh, that was, that a lot of work is, uh, great work has gone into, so that's exciting. Question that yeah? might lead to an action step. <laughs> is there anything that we can do to ensure that Governor Phil Scott signs that bill? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we can call Phil Scott. <laughs> Show up at the State House. Write your legislators. Uh, send them an email, cc the sergeant at arms and let them know, you know, we support this bill. Phil Scott, you know, you have to go forward with it because 
you know, it's gone through a few names. S through. The one that is on the I'll have to get back to you. <laughs> I can I can pull open my phone uh, in just in a moment, but um, yeah, we can call him and talk to him, and you know any support that you could lend to you know Justice for All and Black Lives Matter, the organizations that have really been spearheading it, um, you know just give them a call, find out, get on their listservs, find out what they need. Um, they're super responsive and. It's a, it, it's a great way to support. Um, it's still S116. Yes. Correct, S116. And is Justice for All a national group or is it Justice for All Vermont? Justice for All, uh, Mark Hughes, he started the organization. So it's a, it's a Vermont, it's a local organization. And migrant justice as well. Uh, migrant justice, they're also working. Um, we so some of the successes that we've had there. Uh, they've been, you know, they they've worked to get um, the activists released from prison, uh, from the ice attainment camps. We had a very successful protest uh, that was put on for Ben and Jerry's, and so you know, calling Ben and Jerry's, pressuring them to stay true and and, and to actually follow uh, their steps to be producing milk with dignity and treating their migrant workers with fairness that they deserve. I'd just like to do um, Black Lives Matter and Ebony PR moment. Um, volunteers for the shop are really, really needed. Um, obviously there's a lot of other things you can do, but that's a really solid way to get involved and meet Ebony and other people in the community and, um, you know, take an action step. It's really, it's a fun gig. Um, it, Ebony's great to talk to and connect to and, you know, usually we're like crafting or doing something else, so it's not intimidating, I swear. One shift a week, a month, she will be so appreciative. So, that's my PR moment. Also, uh, the BLM shop, they're, hoping, they're, they're opening it to businesses. So if you guys have meetings with you know, your colleagues and uh, you need to office space outside of that that you really want to have that's interactive, fun, really beautiful, definitely have it there. And it's a great way to support institutionally and bring in people that would otherwise not frequent that space or get a chance to go to that space. So it's, it's doing a lot in, in one. And <laughs> that's true. <laughs> And another Black Lives Matter event, um, Saturday, May 20th, a silent art auction at the O'Brien Center in Winooski. So some art from the shop will be on auction and a raffle and other things. I made a poster for it, so I really should have remembered. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wasn't really raised in a family that was politically active or taught what it was to be a citizen, so this is new to me, and this was my favorite moment from the climate march. Was that your kid? No. no. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Somebody else's. <laughs> but awesome. Um, if anyone else in the group is an educator or a parent, um, there's a really awesome little, I, I refer to it in my mind as a support group, but just a group of teachers and educators and um, other community members who are concerned about um, how to talk to kids about race and racism. Um, we meet every Thursday from six to eight, and there's dinner and childcare provided, and it is the highlight of my week, for sure. As I, I yeah, thank you for <laughs> corroborating that. Yeah. Um, so if if you do work with kids and um, we know that they notice race, they are hearing about race, and so trying to problem solve and 
help lift up one another about leaning into that work and trying to do it in the best way we can. Sometimes it takes a while to remember. So the science march, which was before the climate march, um, so I went and I helped with that and um, we were expecting just a couple hundred people, you know, it was kind of cold and rainy and there were so many people and it didn't really actually get press coverage but it was, I was sort of at the, at the front and I watched the entire thing go by and it was awesome. I mean, there was well over a thousand people there and it was so moving to see people sh get it showing up just to watch people showing up for that and like having a lower expectation and then it was like, oh my God, it was, it was just like, wow, like I'm not the only one who cares. And I think that groups, one of the thing about that that's so powerful is, is, that, is that recognition of, of caring and that, that, that shared part. So that was really good. <laughs> Um, I'd like to celebrate this meeting and uh, I had nothing to do with putting it together, celebrate all you guys, but um, I think my, my biggest thing I ever take away from these meetings is, is showing up, educating yourself, and certainly in between being reminded of that, I personally fall by the wayside and it's nice to have this reminder that there are things you can do to show up and you guys provide so much for us to educate ourselves at home. So I'm going to celebrate remembering to show up and do things. My personal little celebration. <laughs> what was your name? Margaret. Margaret. I want to celebrate Margaret <laughs> because I think that um, when we kind of push back about things that we're hearing, and uh, ask tough questions and create tension. That's when we like grow and that's like when we, as a group and like personally, I mean, I think I learned something about myself tonight, you know, like responding and um, yeah, I just, I really appreciate that in, in spaces and I just wanted to thank you. Well, I want to thank all of you young people and I'm almost speechless because I see a hope here with every single one of you. And thank you very much because I do feel isolated, even being in media. And I, I want to celebrate that this also is recorded and that people can see the work that we are doing together. And thank you, Margaret, because the only reason they are recorded is because of your emailing me and saying, hey, we can get this recorded. <laughs> so thank you. And you made me cry, so thanks for that. Um, I also noticed that um, a lot of us are involved in um, like our own private social groups where we're like, like, I think, Kim, you mentioned an activist book club. And I know Mackenzie's in a, a book club trying to get educated about areas of identity. So I think that's, that's really great and that's, that's an awesome part of this um, movement is, is like that activism and education around social justice as like um, as what you do for fun and what you do in your social life and how you choose to spend your time and creating those, those circles because I, I think this group is especially um, uh, like intimidating probably because many of us don't know each other or have those um, relationships outside of these meetings. And so um, I think that's really awesome when people are making those connections with the people that they do have close relationships with and having these conversations with people that they're close to. Um, that's going to help us all grow stronger. So, <laughs> so let's be real here. Um, <laughs> shall we vote on a name or do we want different names this is we're a small enough group that i feel like we can you were saying you don't feel like enough have they have enough punch and we want to make sure that they have punch yeah well i might be hard to satisfy but i think, yeah. <laughs> I think that 
the kind of, the reason, the, the issue, the challenge that I have with the, with the names, um, the Rose one, the first one, I, I just, again, and maybe it's just, you know, over my head. Um, uh, they sound kind of like white bread. <laughs> I like whole grain bread with a lot yeah. of crunch and a lot of crap in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, like, resist and resist! Like, all right. Like, you're right, R and R's. Like, the World Club was like, come oh, away. You know, okay. I mean, we did, we did use the word show up in here at least five times this evening. So sure. I think trying to find some way that will allow us to show up in the world in a way that, you know, not too many words. Right. You know, that's what I like about what. One word, boom, done, got it. All right, that got me because it was true for me. Right. I can't tell you how many emails I get that have the word resistance in it. I'll probably delete it without even looking at it. And I don't mean that as a bad thing because no, no. I have hundreds of emails and I certainly try to look at at least 80 of them. But what if you want to be 20? So. Right. I mean, I need to put it I just think maybe. Maybe put it out there, like on Facebook, because, I mean, I read the thing, but a lot of people, I, I mean, I know people who would be here, but they're at the concert for Flynn. Like, just put it out there, an email, Facebook, saying, okay, for those of you who didn't read the thing, there's an issue with the name. Right. You know, we want something with a kit. Like, just try to invite more. Like a poll. Well, just like, just throw it out invite, there. Invite in ideas, people's ideas. Yeah, you yeah. know, just, just write a few words down, you know, because something might pop. I mean, I, to be honest, I didn't realize it would be popping tonight, because uh, I, I looked up the word, okay, this is the white girl speaking, I apologize to the who's on here with me, but um, I looked up the word woke so I could find a word with pop that was exactly the same, but was not culturally inappropriate, I'm like, so, that didn't go well. <laughs> I was like, okay, wake, wear the wake clothes, like, right, which yeah. is also like a funeral, right? So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like the idea of having show up in it. I, I think that, like, you keep talking about kind of getting slapped in the face. Like, when you read show up, it's like, slap the face, show up. Like, right. Number that. one thing, you can't <laughs> do anything unless you show up. <laughs> slap in the face, show up. I don't know if it's like... Well, it's a more action. I think yeah. what we're talking about is it's a more action-oriented word than I think, mm. I suspect, I don't know. I suspect one of the things that probably, one of the threads in this tapestry is those of us who show up here want to be in action. And what does that like? Can we find like a just a kicky kind of word yeah. that somehow means like, everything we're saying? How about ignite? Ignite. Well, I did think of that. I looked up. I actually looked up words like that. You know, just ignition. I did look up ignition. Just you know, something that would be more of fire to it. Yeah. And you're saying you feel like one word. We should just find one word. It well, no, I'm like not saying I have any idea what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying I don't really know what I'm saying. But it's not something that's already so overused. I mean, the first one I came up with it was even. It had a lot of words, right? The rose one. Yeah, I, I mean, that was like, it sounded like English tea time or something. No, I, mean, it's, it's I don't mean that's yeah. bad. I mean, it's all. What? What? Seriously, I think it's making it out. Sorry, Kmart. What did you, I didn't even hear what you said. Right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Made by himself today. Uh, <laughs> like, oh, whiskey. Okay. This is good to know. Really. Well, this, right. this will be why we wanted to sign all yeah. together. Um, so I'm not opposed to continuing thinking and reaching yeah. out to others because I, I, I'm really set on something that we all love and gets our attention. And it doesn't have to be one syllable of that works right. really well for me, and I'm just attached to it. Okay. But that's, you know, that's part of why it worked, you know, that's... I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't say rise and resist. I'm like, have you seen those words before? Right. Like, a lot? A lot, a lot, yeah, exactly. You probably throw the women's symbol in the fist while we're at it. Yeah. <laughs> and I also, the thing with the femme part also is I want to endorse exactly. more guys. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We are at first Right, you don't have to, to have to be female to be a feminist. You don't exactly. have to be white to be a racist. I mean, I got it. All right, I'll be quiet. Can I propose some? Yes. Bring the mic. So I, I think let's let's put it out there to.
collect some ideas of other suggestions. So everybody think, think, think about it as you're going through your life. If you think of any good names, send them our way. And then we can always do like an electronic survey yeah. poll. Mm -hmm. And then decide that way. Because I know, and then our, we had a few people here. Yeah, they're from my kids. Um, and there are a few people here who had to leave, so I don't want them to miss out on voting. And because um, they were totally part of our conversation at the beginning. And I know other people weren't here today, and I can involve them too. Who may you know, for all the big picture. Yeah, and they engage in electronic platform and things like that. So, yeah. Does that sound good? Yes. Oh man, I like making decisions, but okay. You are I'll wait. I'll wait. Right. Okay. Well, we're giving it like when, when's the next one you said is May? May 24th, 24th. is going to be kind of like our mini uh, huddle um, again at Skinny Pancake. For those of you who came last time, thank you. A lot of you are here. I appreciate that. Um, and I thought it worked out personally. I felt like really energized after it. Um, I felt like we made a lot of good, I don't want to, like, a lot of you guys are here, so I don't want to like, talk for anybody, but I felt like I made a lot of really nice, solid connections, and we were able to talk one-on-one -on -one and make meaningful connections and, you know, discuss things that are really important to me in um, a pretty meaningful and authentic way. So I, I appreciated that. So the next one's, again, going to be at Skinny Pancake um, on Wednesday. May 24th, so hopefully you can come along and ha be ready for one-on-one -on -one conversations about kind of hopefully challenging topics for you. Get ready to challenge one another <laughs> in a supportive <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah, and nachos. <laughs> How soon do you guys want to have the name change? That is your question, Just because I know there's probably some sense of urgency, but there's oh, also, yeah. you know, I, I feel like it's important for even people who, who aren't speaking up, like, you know, people who haven't spoke, like, maybe you have an idea or a word, or maybe bits of your words would fit with bits of their words, you know, and it could create, you know, some, some really good chemistry if, if you have a lot of things generated. Something might come out of maybe a not so good idea. That's really good. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily read the article, like if they know they're not coming and that we're all so busy, they're not necessarily going to read the one. So there's probably a lot of people who are completely clueless and have absolutely no idea about what just happened. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe a post or something like the like places that they want email to the full group, sort of giving a very succinct background and what, you know, name change and recommending. Um, suggestions. Maybe yeah. we could submit ideas and then process of elimination, like this many got this many votes. Okay, now let's try these three. They got this many. Yeah, you could probably edit it down. There might be some that you just hate and you should just like be like, you know, Supreme Command is out. Right. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a point. Yes. yes. Thank you guys.